what are we doing today? We're gonna be talking about plants. So let's go. We're gonna go to the greenhouse? Yes. Alright, let's go to Bevel. Alright. So, you'll probably notice that we have two main types of plants in here. We have grasses and we have succulents. Uh, one thing I want to talk about today is the convergent evolution that we see between succulents. So, right here, this is a Sepelia. Uh, Sepelia is a genus in the family. I'm going to say this wrong. Uh, you know what? The milkweed family. Sepelia is a succulent genus native to South Africa. And what's interesting is a lot of the times people will confuse this with cacti. So right here we have a couple of cacti. Um, however, these are not closely related phylogenetically at all. This is a good example of convergent evolution. Yeah. So a lot of the times what we'll see is this old world, new world disjunction between plants. So these are old world species where cactaceae uh, is primarily New World, you're only going to find them in North and South America. And the same case goes for uh, agaves versus aloes. And so what you'll notice is the aloes look very similar to these agaves that we have over here. Um, that is another example of converging evolution between desert adapted plants. Here is actually an aloe that is flowering. Oh, look at that. So, what aloes and what agaves have in common is that they typically will shoot up a center stalk from their basal rosette. So does this happen, is this an annual thing or when, how, when so, does it shoot up? It actually varies. So in agaves, they're monocarpic, which means after they flower, they die. Oh, wow. What you can do is if you see it starting to develop a stalk, cut the stalk off and prevent it from flowering and therefore killing itself. Um, I do do a little bit of research on agave, but that's not my primary focus. So this is polyanthes. Um, this is not polyanthes. Cut that. What's fun is they all look the same. This is polyanthes tuberosa. This is one of those species that I do research on. No one sort of really knows the delineations of the genus. And so there's two sort of classifications for agave. There's like true agaves, which we have in there, and then it's agave followed by some Latin. Polyanthes is in this, Prochianthes, and something else I can't remember off the top of my head. Polyanthes is a really cool genus that's endemic to Mexico. Uh, this is Polyanthes tuberosa. It's well known for its uh, floral volatiles that it produces, and so a lot of the time the extracts from this plant are used in perfume. Many historical researchers believe that it was widely cultivated by the Aztec uh, societies, and so it no longer grows in the wild, but only in cultivation. So I do research on its wild relatives, uh, Polyanthes gemniflora, which is uh, hummingbird pollinated, and then Polyanthes montana, which is hawk pollinated. Just like uh, Montana, it, it has white flowers that are highly fragrant, um, whereas Geminiflora has red flowers uh, that are smaller and tubular and not fragrant at all. So I'm studying the genomic architecture underlying the full development process. But I guess a lot of people who don't really know much about plants, they just assume that everything is poll pollinated by like a bee. bee. Yeah, so there's a variety of different pollinators for different plants. And so cacti, for example, are typically pollinated by uh, bats, larger ones, like so the giant saguaros that you see in the Sonoran Desert are typically pollinated by bats. They produce uh, nocturnally blooming white flowers. Zepelia, uh, which I'll be very careful with this, produces a sapromyophilus flower. And so it produces this big, giant red, fleshy colored flower 
that will attract fly pollinators because it has floral volatile that produce the smell of rotting flesh. We have yucca alifolia here, and so yuccas are really interesting because they actually have a really cool coevolutionary story with uh, the yucca moth. And so it's this example of a mutualistic relationship between plants and their pollinators that have evolved over uh, a very long time. This is a, a type of pollination called nursery pollination in which the yucca moths will lay their eggs in the flowers of the yucca. The yucca moth ovipositor matches the style length of the yucca. One of my outside community members, Chris Smith, has been doing a lot of population genetics work to figure out the delineations of yucca and yucca moth relationships in Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree is just a giant yucca. It's one of the few monocots that's considered a tree. You can basically split flowering plants up into two major sections. You have your dicots and your monocots. There's also other sections um, for earlier branching flowering plants, like the magnolias. In this lab, we typically focus our research on monocots. So, aloes are a monocot, gaves are a monocot, yuccas are a monocot, grasses are a monocot. So, over here we have Hespero yucca whippoli. And so, Hespero yucca is another independent origin of yucca moth pollination. This, if you were to look at a full mature adult, these guys get pretty large, um, grows flowers that are very similar to the yucca flower, but are also a little bit different. And phylogenetic analysis has determined that these actually are kind of distant from yucca itself, coming out in a different clade. And so many scientists believe that this is an independent origin of that yucca moth mutualistic relationship. Well guys, this is where I leave you.